perfecto. Eh, ¿no? eh, aquí invitan a visitarnos, eh, invitamos más bien al profesor de una universidad alemana en Koblenz, el doctor Buncho, Stefan Buncho, que eh, estudió en Frankfurt, hizo su tesis de maestría y doctorado con el conocido, digamos, alumno de Roca Madonna, Alfred Schmidt. ¿no? Es una, la tesis de maestría sobre Lucas, no la de doctorado sobre Marcuse. Entonces, eh, es un gran conocedor entonces de temas del marxismo crítico, del marxismo occidental, de la teoría crítica. Y hoy nos va a hablar de una cuestión, digamos, inspirada en la teoría crítica y estudios que se en el continente americano sobre los estudios sobre autoridad y familia y esto ya ha aplicado o digamos a partir de ahí unas reflexiones sobre el problema del racismo y su vinculación con, con como vínculo entre democracia y extrema derecha entonces eh, bueno bienvenido a Sajas y Picón y después va a haber un espacio ¿no? para discusión ¿no? yo soy Sajas y Picón gracias por la invitación I'm sorry that I don't speak Spanish, but I never learned it. I have to, to try, but um, now I speak English. I try to speak very slowly. I need for that um, maybe 60 minutes for the lecture. And later, if you have questions, you can discuss it. Um, I want to say, okay, the title of the lecture is Racism as a link between democracy and right-wing extremism. The American studies in the authoritarian personality of the critical theory revisited. So um, I'm working with um, these uh, studies in authoritarian personality. Um, the research was made in the United States of America, but my examples of the current situation are examples from Germany and Europe. So I use the critical theory for the situation in Europe. And you have to decide what does it mean for the American continent. Okay. Um, it's a great honor for, honor for me to speak at the UNAM, because it's uh, a well-known university in Europe. And uh, it's a very uh, an old university which, uh, with a rich tradition. Um, And um, I know that Mexico has a great tradition of revolution. And you know that in Germany we have some problems with our revolution. <laughs> that didn't come to an end. And uh, we had uh, really negative tendencies in history. But I will say a little bit more later on. The topic of my lecture is uh, first the outlining of what authoritarianism means how the extreme right thinks and in which way their thoughts are related to the racism in the heart of society. Finally, I will present the program of a particular workshop as an example of work against authoritarianism in the field of political education. But I think if I'm speaking about racism and right-wing extremism, it's important for you to know um, how is my own theoretical point of view and how is my own practical point of view because um, I my, myself are a member of a society which is a racist society so I have to um, clear what is my position in this um, discussion about racism first I will um, explain you my theoretical um, point of view After this um, hearing, maybe you will understand better why I'm speaking about the connection between racism and democracy. Even though I live in a country which is supposed to be rich, powerful, solid, clean, we are the term self-satisfied, and full of workaholics, you know, and we don't have self-argument. It doesn't exist. <laughs> But surely you know that the Germany, that Germany is responsible for the cruelest wars, wars of the past century, World War I and World War II, and for the Holocaust against Jews and Sinti and Roma, the so-called Gypsies, I think uh, Chitanos. 
The legal term crimes against humanity was created to define the Holocaust at the Nuremberg trials against German war criminals, which were held after World War II. In the context of World War II, Mexico was one of the nations which opened its franchise in the 1930s and 1940s to German refugees who escaped the German National Socialism. Left-minded refugees, the so-called other, better or free Germans, could come to Mexico. Well known are the famous German writer Anna Segers and the authors and Republican fighters in the Spanish Civil War, Ludwig Rehm and Gustav Bickler. But there are a lot of other persons, you know it. I feel myself standing in the tradition of this other or anti-fascist Germany and combine this position with a critical view on Western civilization. This point of view is based on the critical theory, the so-called Frankfurt School with outstanding thinkers like Paul Kleimer, Adorno, Marcuse, but you know it well. <laughs> Good teacher, I think. <laughs> He's well informed. <laughs> they call themselves dialectical thinkers, which means they work intellectually with the tools of enlightenment against the destructive tendencies of enlightenment. They did not want to distinguish between a good and a bad Germany or a good and a bad Western tradition. Like the Marxist philosophers Ernst Bloch and Georg Lukacs, Lukacs Gör, did it. The Frankfurt School argues that destructive tendencies are deeply inscribed in Western enlightenment. While from a theoretical point of view, I share the position of the Frankfurt School. From a political point of view, I rather agree with Bloch and Lukacs on their description of the two paths for mankind, the path to freedom and the path to destruction. Antonio Gramsci and Max Horkheimer used the same expression to describe their skeptical position in theory and their more optimistic position in practice. They called it theoretical pessimism and practical optimism. So this is my theoretical point of view. <coughs> I'm describing a little bit the practical point of view. And to show you in my practical work the important role of the American studies of prejudices in the fight against racism in Germany and Europe. I'm presently working as a professor on child and youth services in the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Applied Sciences in Koblenz, Germany. My subjects of teaching are the living conditions of young people, their attitudes and behaviors, especially in the field of discrimination, youth violence, stereotypes, and racism prevention programs. Before teaching at university, I worked for 10 years as managing director of a German center against racism and anti-Semitism. In those 10 years, I learned many things about anti-democratic, right-wing tendencies in Germany and Europe. Today, there is a widespread research on discrimination in Germany, which is ba based on the studies against prejudices from the 1950s until now. Two crucial texts about prejudices published in that decade are still considered classics for the discussion about the subject. Both were written in the United States of America. The first is The Authoritarian Personality, published by the Institute of Social Research in New York in 1950. The title of the second important publication is The Nature of Prejudice, published in 1954 by Gordon W. Orpon. At the latest, since the critique of intolerance, superstition and fanaticism by the famous French encyclopedists in the century of enlightenment, I mean such uh, philosophers like uh, Denis Diderot or scientists like um, Jean Laurent d'Alembert, there exists a systematic critique of prejudice. The two publications mentioned before, they are the first which combine an elaborated theoretical approach with an empirical research. You know, the encyclopedists didn't, uh, didn't done uh, empirical research. Uh, it started 
maybe at the beginning of the 20th century. But after, since this uh, uh, combined studies from Allport and uh, Adorno on the Institute of Social Research, we have a long and rich tradition of study from prejudice, but all later studies have to make reference to the former ones. The empirical research about prejudice was initiated by the shock of what happened in World War II, especially in Europe. The Holocaust is the center of the horror. The historian Dan Dinner called it the break of civilization, and Horkheim and Adorno called it the dialectic of enlightenment. This means that Western civilization had given up all its political and moral demands in the years between 1940 and 1945, and not uh, only today. So we are living in a, in a, in a maybe post-Western uh, civilization. The Holocaust is an experience of mankind and goes as such beyond any particular experience. The Holocaust is not only a German or European incident. It happened in World War II, and you know, it was a global war and Mexico was one of the allies against Germany too. But the Holocaust seems to be the extreme of any human objectification because it was a de deliberate industrial process of extermination of human beings. It broke the continuum of history, not in the sense Walter Benjamin imagined, but in a negative way. And this negativity was made absolute. The presence of the National Socialism showed itself in the light of total control. The victims of National Socialism had no prospects. Their only horizon was the reality of that total control. The dialectic of enlightenment shows National Socialism and the Holocaust as the logical consequence of Western history and at the same time as a negative jump out of this continuity and rational logic. The dialectical process imploded, the historical development stopped. This is not only the cruel experience of the most persecuted peoples, the Jews and the Sinti of Roma, the Gypsies, but the suffering of Jews and Gypsies stands for the pain of all human beings. The existential experience is that human beings became victims without, to speak in the terms of Jean-Paul Sartre, without the possibility of decision and without any economic or military rationality. Unlike the Jews and the Gypsies, the political enemies of National Socialism were quotation marks, privileged in relation to Jews and Gypsies. They were privileged to decide freely if they wanted to fight National Socialism or not. This is the, the stigma of the following generations of the victims of the racist persecution. This experience separates fundamentally Jews and Gypsies from the political victims of the Nazi regime. The decision to be with or against Nazism was each person's own option. But as a Jew or, or a Gypsy, no one was free to choose whether or not to risk being mistreated and killed, for this was the decision of the Germans. If they decided that you were a Jew and a Gypsy, or a Gypsy, your own opinion and identity didn't matter. This negates the philosophical term of possibility in a real, practical way. It challenges the human existence itself. Today, Western societies, and by that I mean uh, especially Western Europe countries like France, Italy, Germany, Great Britain, and the United States of America, believe that their democracy rejects racism and discrimination. But this, I think, is sheer ideology. The, the sociologist Howard Winnant argues that, I quote, today racism operates in societies and institutions that explicitly condemn prejudice and discrimination. And reputation. In this context, it is interesting to note that the empirical data 
at, of the first studies on prejudices and against racism were gathered from the population of the United States of America. The type of the authoritarian character is not extracted from the fascist, fascist German people, but from ordinary citizens in the United States of America. So this is the link between right-wing extremism and the normality in the democratic society. So I will now clear a little bit the question what does authoritarianism means. In the Western world, it is common knowledge that right-wing propaganda is the contrary of democratic thinking and behavior. I said it before. But since the middle of the 20th century, different studies demonstrate the opposite. The strong link between democracy and right-wing extremism. This link is found in the authoritarian attitude, which is widespread in democratic society. Adorno's statement that fascist tendencies inside democracies are more dangerous than fascist tendencies against democracy is still valid in our days. This means that the right-wing tendencies are not coming from outside but from inside of Western society because this society produces and demands authoritarian tendencies by itself. The scientific term authoritarianism stands in the tradition of the studies of the authoritarian personality. The classic variables of authoritarianism include conventionalism, authoritarian submission and aggression, superstition, the belief in power, destructiveness and projectivity. And together they form the syndrome of authoritarianism. And this syndrome defines the identity or the character of a person. The term syndrome is defined by the interdependence of the different patterns. If somebody has significant results in one of the patterns, Surely he has deep-seated prejudices in most of other, the other fields. This demonstrates the power of prejudices and why it is so difficult to work against them. They stabilize each other. Current German studies support this theory. The sociologist Wilhelm Heidmeier has gathered empirical data about authoritarian attitudes over 10 years from 2002 to 2012 in Germany. He has defined the syndrome of group-focused enmity. He distinguishes different forms of this enmity, defending the right to privileges for the native white population, nationalism, classical sexism, racism, anti-Semitism, anti-Siganism, this is the enmity against the gypsies, Islamophobia, homophobia, and enmity against homeless, unemployed, disabled, or asylum-seeking persons. These forms are all different forms of enmity because they have some different expressions. But together, they form one syndrome, the syndrome of the group focus enmity, as he called it. All of these enmities follow the same basic principle. The distinction between the own group, the we, which is privileged, and the other, which can be discriminated. Stuart Hall, the founder of the Cultural Studies in Great Britain, argues that this binary thinking is, is the basic structure of racism and is deeply rooted in Western, in Western structure of thoughts. Heidmeier refers to the ideology of disparity as the, the common ground of the different enmities. The results of the current studies about authoritarianism in Europe and Germany are alarming. I will give you some figures in the chapter about racism. The major hypothesis of the studies in the authoritarian personality is, I quote, that the political, economic, 
and social convictions of an individual often form a broad and coherent pattern, as if bound together by a mentality or spirit, and that this pattern is an expression of deep lying trends in his personality. End of quotation. But these deep lying trends are rooted in the social demands on the individual. In his book, Education to Maturity, Adorno speaks about the elbow society. It's a picture of the capitalist society. Um, Heidmeier uses these terms in his studies too. It means that one fundamental principle of capitalist societies, that we all compete against each other, produces hate and indifference against others. The hate will be transformed in discrimination and violence, mainly performed by groups, which are united only by the common hatred of others, but without any real solidarity within the group. And this is a sign of the right-wing extremism. They don't know solidarity. They are built, they are built only as a group against others, and in the fight, in the destructive fight. They don't use and they don't understand the term for good. So what does right-wing extremism mean? Right-wing extremism is one of the strongest forms of authoritarianism. More or less, since the reunification of Germany, there exists a greater discussion about right-wing extremism in Germany and Europe. Empirical studies show that today between 8 and 10 percent of the German people are convinced right-wing extremists in attitude, not in action, but in attitude. Many more share some of their views. A group of political and social scientists elaborated a definition of right-wing extremism which distinguishes between right-wing attitudes and behavior. The behavior is partitioned in one form is the protest. It means that you <coughs> may be walking with right-wing extremists, but it's not necessary that you are a convinced right-wing extremist. So, so, so you can be somebody who walks with them only. But this is an interesting question for the analytics to understand who is a convinced right-wing extremist and uh, by which persons is the ideology um, not a closed ideology. So you can break it with other arguments. We have the protests, we have uh, the behavior in elections, we have the participation, this is a stronger form um, of um, yeah, to participate in right-wing extremism. Then we have the membership in parties or in uh, comradeships. These are stronger forms of um, brutal right-wing extremism in Germany. And uh, you have the violence or the terror as a special sign of right-wing extremism. But not violence, uh, I, I mean, the violence of right-wings is terror. It's not violence, it's terror. So we have to um, distinguish in the term of violence. You know. The attitudes are a strong nationalism. This means you think your nation is better than other nations and has the right to dominate other countries. Social Darwinism is a central point. It speaks, this uh, social Darwinism means um, there's a slogan, the survival of the fittest. They think about the survival of the fittest. This is a wrong transition from Darwin's theory of nature to society, and it's called a natural fallacy, or you can call it a natural fallacy. They don't think it's, it's right. The Nazis and many other people think that only the fittest, understood as the most powerful, will survive in society. And they argue that this pseudo, pseudo natural law is morally good. Then we have, as an attitude, anti-Semitism. 
This means the enmity against Jews because they are Jews. Adorno calls it the rumor about the Jews. And I think this is a really good definition of anti-Semitism. Because it, it, had, it has nothing to do with the real life of Jews, but only with the abstract imagines from the anti-Semitists. And it's really um, abstract and pseudo-concrete. So the term rumor defines anti-Semitism exactly. Racism is a central point. In the definition of right-wing extremism, racism is defined in the tradition of the late 19th century as enmity and debasement of people mainly on biological arguments. But I think, and I will um, explain it later, that uh, today the term racism is a little bit broader. It's not, the biological racism is a special form of this is what we um, define as racism, and the racism is lying in this binary structure of uh, we and others and uh, good and bad. But I will explain it later. Authoritarianism is one attitude. Um, authoritarianism in the ideas about state concepts and state structures, and uh, for example, uh, authoritarianism in education. And a central point in Germany, but I know in the right-wing extremism in the United States too, the claim down of National Socialism and the denial of the Holocaust. It is difficult, maybe, to imagine that some people in Germany deny the Holocaust. They argue that the Holocaust is, a, is, a, is an invention and a lie of the Jews to make the world feel morally guilty. Unfortunately, such arguments are widespread in the world. The right-wing movement in Germany changed in the 1990s. It modernized and radicalized itself. Until the 80s, right-wing extremism was dominated by the generation which grew up under National Socialism. So it was a movement which always looked back to the past and their politics were not at the peak of the time. This changed radically with the German reunification and the new power of the reunified state. There were major discussions about migration policy, the right of asylum, and the citizenship for foreigners. 182 people, as a minimum figure, were killed by right-wing persons in Germany between 1990 and 2011. At the end of 2011, the police discovered in Germany a terrorist group called National Socialist Underground, which had murdered 10 immigrants between 2000 and 2006. They discovered it only in 2011, five years after the last murder. During the, those six years, the police investigated in the migrant communities because they saw this was a conflict inside the migrant communities. And they didn't follow the signs which, which are um, the signs which are showing that there must be some right-wing extremists um, in this, uh, in this uh, killings involved. So I don't want to imply that all German policemen are Nazis. I don't think this is the right uh, position. But a lot of them, they are normal citizens, and a lot of them share racist or discriminating opinions like the average of population. This is the point, because uh, that the um, investigations went wrong. So they can't imagine that, it, that this, these killings is not a problem of the migrant communities because they are thinking about the Turkish Mafia, the Italian Mafia, and so on and so on. They don't think about the own Mafia, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, the own uh, um, criminal structures in, in the German state. I, I don't know if you if you followed the, in the last year, we had a big problem of the secret services about this, um, this group because um, there, there were 
in the last 10 years different possibilities to get to school. But the secret services, they um, worked against each other. Sometimes they didn't want to catch them, mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, we have a big discussion about the function of the Secret Service. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's in all countries <laughs> the same, maybe. But um, the Secret Service in Germany works with, um, um, with undercover persons. Mm -hmm. These undercover, uh, undercover persons uh, are, in the same time, they are right-wing extremists. Mm -hmm. And um, a commission said, um, if if you um, if you don't want that this will um, will will come another way, if you will change such a problem, so you have um, stop to work with undercover right wing extremists, and the politicians decided to strengthen. The, um, the work with undercover right-wing extremists. So decided, the politician decided um, the opposite of what um, the commission said. So it's, uh, it's really a political problem now in Germany. I think, and I said it, that the investigation mistake of the police is not random. It's not contingent. It shows how the normal individual and institutional resistance works hand in hand with the right wing movement. But the terror is only the tip of the iceberg. The modernized right wing movement succeeded in some parts of Germany, for example in citizen advice offices. It started campaigns against the Islam and Muslim immigrants. With these, with, with these activities, it gets in contact with the racist behavior of the average citizen. So I'm coming now to the behavior of the average citizen, and then I will um, explain one form of political ed education to handle with racism, right, and extremism, and then um, the lecture is coming to an end. <clears throat> it's okay? Can you? Pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> the range of racism and discrimination is much broader than right-wing extremism. As I announced before, here are some current figures about racist and related attitudes. I said that 8 to 10 percent of the German population are right-wing extremists in attitude. This means that they um, share all of the Patterns, I um, said, it, I told before, and uh, if you are only a nationalist and an anti-Semite, it's not necessary that you share all of right-wing ideology. But um, there, there are connections in these lines, and this is the problem. I think well, this is the problem, um, or the, this strengthens the connection between right-wing extremism and um, normal discrimination in our society. Approximately 30% of the German population are against Muslim immigration to Germany. 40% have prejudices against foreigners. Between 8 and 2% argue in an anti-Semitic way. The difference in the results depends from the study you quote. So it's interesting um, because, you know, anti-Semitism is uh, officially forbidden in Germany. So you can go maybe in jail to uh, an open anti-Semit. And the researchers think um, they are speaking from social desired results, maybe. And so the researchers say maybe the anti-Semitism in Germany is much higher than, they, uh, than the figures show. Approximately 12% share biological racist arguments. The current critical theory of racism defines an argumentation as racist, not because it is based on a biological argument, but because of the binary structure of the argumentation, which is more widespread than the biological argumentation, as I mentioned before. Robert Miles, 
distinguishes three steps in a racist construction. On the first step, racism is defined through its fundamental structure, the binarity between the we and the other. On the second step, different values are assigned to the constructed group. And these values are opposite. The values of the we are good, the values of the other are bad. We are white, the other is black. We are rational, the other is emotional. We are civilized, the other, the other is uncultivated, and so on. <coughs> on the third step, the ideology ideological structure of racism is completed with the creation of a hierarchy of groups based on group values. It is important to understand that these three steps are only distinguished analytically and not historically. So it's not following the history of uh, societies. It's um, only an analytically distinguished. Racism is not only an ideological form but a social structure as well. It is not only a prejudice, but also a powerful social and global system to dominate the world. Right-wing extremists always claim, when they attack other people, that, that their actions agree with the unspoken opinion of the majority. And the surveys confirm it. Therefore, when we discuss right-wing extremism, we cannot ignore racism and related patterns at the heart of society because they are the link between the normal, which I call in Western countries the democratic citizens, and state, and the right-wing extremist behavior and state concept. So, what can we do against this connection? And what, how can we work against right-wing extremism and racism? This is a complicated and broad question I can try and answer only, or I will try and answer here only in the field of education, because I am working in this field. No. Um, but it's, it's a question of all levels of, uh, of the society. So it's not only the level of education, it's not only the level of uh, policy or so. so. You have to work where you stand against racism. Although it is clear that education cannot eliminate racism if racism is understood as a social structure, it can strengthen with its small forces the critical thought and self-reflexivity of persons. It can sharpen the awareness that democracy, racism and right-wing extremism are not simply different things but that conventional democracy, without permanent democratization, without this permanent democratization, you know from Marcuse and others, they are speaking that the democracy has to revolutionize itself always, and will not be, if we have only a conventional democracy, it will not be the opposite of right-wing extremism. And so you can see in the, um, in the studies in authoritarian personality, um, there are different types of authoritarian characters, and there exists uh, uh, um, on the democratic side a conventional type of democrat. But this conventional type is only a democrat um, when his society is a democracy. And so he changes his mind if, when his uh, society changes. And this is the point uh, which happened in uh, the, the year 1933. Germany. So you, you, you had different Democrats there. You, you have not, not many different that right in Germany in the 20s. So it uh, was uh, told it was a republic without Republicans. Right? But um, the Republicans with, uh, who were, who lived in, in Germany, they changed their mind after 1933. Only a few refugees and other fighters they are staying and fighting in. So, I will describe only one program of political educational training which combines the analysis of right wing extremism and the critique of racism and other forms of group focused enmity. So, 
I, I, I will show you this program because I think this is one possible answer to, um, to discuss this um, connection between the normal racism and right wing extremism. Normally, the political edu education in Germany works only against right wing extremism, and they think the extremism is outside of our society. These are bad guys, uh, and they are has nothing to do with democracy in our society. And um, there are some um, programs in political education um, which now try to discuss um, the racism in the middle of the society together with the right-wing extremism. Maybe the term right-wing extremism is wrong. So, but I don't want, maybe we, we can discuss it later. Um, because in Germany it's an interesting discussion. Um, but because this term extremism defines the extremists as outside of society, and I think this is a wrong, a wrong picture of the reality. So the training program from which I'm speaking now um, is launched by two institutions which are working in the field of non-formal political education. They are working out of school. They discuss in nine sessions, and uh, every session um, lasts one whole day. Firstly, the role of the educa educational staff in the teaching. And this is really important, because you have first to understand what role as a teacher you have in the racist structure. And maybe you reproduce racist structures in your teaching. Then they are discussing the attitudes of extreme right uh, and political praxis of the extreme right. And then they are going to the um, discriminating attitudes of the middle, middle classes to ethnicity, ethnicity and racism, anti-Semitism, the discrimination of the homeless, the unemployed and disabled person. They are discussing in this uh, training nationalism and nation building. And then they are discussing um, critical instruments like intersectionality or diversity, but a critical form of diversity, that's to say, and democracy trainings. And at the end of the program, um, they discuss practical consequences of this training for the work of the members of the training. The program starts with the right wing extremism of today progresses to the ideology and structure of contemporary society and the themes of the middle classes and explains the historical background. This contextualization of right-wing extremism widens education against right-wing extremism to a socio-critical education. And this should be the perspective of all critical education, working in specialized fields without losing the societal connection. So I come to the summary. I would like, um, I, I wanted to, 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 to show at the beginning, I tried to show, the importance of the studies of the Frankfurt School in the US American exile for my own theoretical approach. And I'm only an example of some German political ed academics influenced by this theory and the understanding of what was happened in Western societies since the 20th, 20th century to our days. Secondly, I argued that radical negative incidents or movement, movements like fascism, national social, socialism or right-wing extremism are intrinsic to Western democratic countries. I outlined the importance of the concept of the authoritarian personality to understand the relationship between right-wing movements and normal citizens, normal, always in quotation marks. Right-wing extremism is the execration of ordinary prejudices. It is, in the words of Ernst Bloch, the concrete possibility of normal destructivity. My conclusion is the following. Those who do not wish to talk about racism at the heart of society should be silent about right-wing extremism. You hear Max Horkheimer behind this. 
Finally, I plead for a critical political education which links the critique of right-wing extremism to a critique of current society. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you for your lecture. It was very, very interesting. Um, there's many, many, many things to discuss from, from what you said, but I would like to begin with um, with a question. Um, there's um, this uh, study about the psychology of the masses under uh, fascism in uh, Germany, made by the famous uh, uh, Marxist uh, psychoanalyst, psychoanalyst uh, Wilhelm Reich. Mm -hmm. Probably you have heard of him? The, and I know it, um, <coughs> Psychology of the Masses. Yeah. Yes. The title. Yeah, so, well, um, among many things, he describes the problem um, of uh, fascism and authoritarian authoritarianism in German society uh, previous to World War II and inside the um, authoritarian structure of the German conservative family. Um, so, well, um, I would like to ask you if, um, if since then, um, there have been changes in that uh, authoritarian structure in Germany, uh, or if we can think um, that the same authoritarian structure inside the family applies to all Western uh, civilization. Um, I think the family has changed. Mm. So we can say it in, in the same way as um, before in the studies and prejudices of the term family is central uh, in, in the discussions. Um, maybe we have, I have another problem and it's uh, called like the absence of the father in the families. Mm -hmm. And um, so you have um, um, the young people, they don't have uh, in the family, they, they don't have branches in the family. And so they are working we discuss it in, in uh, the, uh, the youth. This is more in uh, the problem of, um, of the groups or the cliques of young persons. They have to um, socialize th themselves mainly, and this socialization works in um, the definition against others, and so they work. I, because of that, I think um, the term authoritarianism of the um, um, studies and prejudices. It changed a little bit. We have a, a, a discussion in political theory about authoritarianism too. And uh, they, they say it's not possible only with um, one approach to declare um, what authoritarianism means. So they have not only to look to, uh, to psycho uh, social, psychological aspects, but to cultural aspects, to political aspects, and so on. So I think um, you have to modify um, the, the approaches to declare authoritarianism. It's not. It's not only there are tendencies of authoritarianism in families too, but um, many of the families have other or structures. Um, more without branches. <coughs> so the, the concept of Freud doesn't function in, in the classical way. So speaking about uh, the possibility of education to eradicate racism, I'm interested in this uh, program that you mentioned program of political education. How is it structured and who who gives it uh, 
uh, who supervises it. Uh, how, how do you go about it? Okay, this is a this is an inter interesting point because I think uh, political education is a big field in Germany, and uh, it's in the tradition of um, it was implanted by the uh, U.S. Americans after World War II to um, to re-educate. The term was re-education of the German population to re-educate to democracy and. Uh, so we have a tradition of uh, 50, 60 years now of political education. And in the 1990, after the reunification, there was a discussion mm -hmm. that the Germans didn't need any more political education because they are now educated. <laughs> but uh, <coughs> 1993, 1994, we had a lot of racism. Maybe you remember there were pogroms in Germany against as asylum seekers, and it was clear that uh, political education is necessary in Germany. But it's structured; it's paid. A lot of political education is paid from the state, from the Ministry of Education, from the Ministry of Family, Children, Young People, and uh, Women. It's, I think it's, it's a, so. It's a, they are. The ministry gives gives the money, <coughs> but it structures in uh, different institutions, and the institutions are um, making their political education at their own. So we have a um, great federal federal structure of political education, and in this um, field, we have from conservative points of view political education to anarchic points of view. Uh -huh. But sometimes we have a big uh, discussion because uh, we have programs against right-wing extremism. And um, if you get the money, you have to s describe um, that you are that you are standing um, on the on the basic of the um, mm -hmm. of the German democracy on the on the convention that you are standing on the convention of Germany uh -huh. and that you are not an extremist constitution, mm -hmm. constitution you know. and this is a big discussion now I see. because we say if we are strong democracy it's not necessary to ask everybody where he's standing now and this I think is in the United States they are, it's a strong democracy they are really problematic tendencies you know, but uh, they don't need such regulations, and in France too, they know that they are from beginning republics. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Mm, some days ago I was reading uh, a authoritarian family from, by Horkheimer, and in some part of this essay, he, he says that like example, uh, the structure of the Indian society, uh, the caste, that's the name, I don't know. The, yes, that's the name, the caste. Sorry. Yes. And he, he talks about uh, this kind of society can even the bottom of the society, of the pyramid, can say the worst part of uh, their society, uh, even with all the terrible circumstances that they have to live. Um, he, he talks about if even with this uh, contrast with the Occidental uh, okay. society, they can't see this terrible situation. And each individual um, thought that uh, is the best uh, situation that they can or that each of they can live because the um, ideological uh, religion point of view about their reincarnation or mm -hmm. these kind of things uh, have another possibility in their new life no? but 
uh, like Occidental, uh, I thought, oh, that's terrible, no? But when you talk about democracy, I thought about, uh, it's like this kind of ideological point of view. We, we can thought that it is different because the rationality and the illustration uh, give us another point of view, like a superiority point of view. But when you talk about uh, this structure of the authority personality uh, inside of each individual, mm -hmm. uh, I was I was asking myself if we can really see uh, all these terrible circumstances that each individual have to live in this society because we have another um, I, I don't know how to say that like a veil veil like the, this kind of society that can see that the reincarnation is just a, a veil no? Um, well, I don't know if I am clear <laughs> about it, but it is like a answer I uh, ask you about if is you can see this kind of uh, ideology, the democracy is a kind of this uh, society ideology. Um, I want to say two, two, two things. <laughs> Firstly, um, I'm a little bit skeptical um, about um, the, the centering the discussion of authoritarian personality to the individual aspect. So this would be a part of critique of mine on the on the critical theory studies at this point, because. Um, and this is um, the discussion in uh, the modern racism theory that um, it's the whole is social structure it's which uh, constructs uh, racist society and it's not only uh, individual behavior. So um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm I will make a critique to this, or maybe the critical theory at this point can read, um, can read um, a little bit uh, in, like individualism. Yeah. So I think family family structures are important, but it's not the heart of our society. It's a part of our society, so you have to, to research about. But it's not the center. <coughs> family, to understand family as the center of our society, I think this is ideology of the conservatives. <laughs> <laughs> the other point, if I understand right, um, I don't know exactly. Um, because I think a little bit, and at this point I'm nearer to the critical theory or to my views. I think that the um, Western civilization and the process of globalization, globalization, globalization um, is really strong. And so we have a lot of differences uh, between the different parts of the world. And I see it in the next city, so it's different <laughs> to my city. Um, but I see also the, the big trade traits and uh, I see the same cars on the street, and, uh, the same in, in the form, organization and so on and so, so I think um, we are living in only one world and I don't know if we have, oh, it's, it's a difficult question to ask what is outside, <laughs> what is outside of this uh, globalized culture now? And I, I, I didn't, I, I don't know exactly if uh, this point which you said is a religious point. 
No, no. it's because uh, he said that uh, <coughs> even when the economic circumstances change, yes. uh, the, the people, the population of the country, of a culture, can, um, can keep in the same uh, point of view, even if the, the new circumstance is against and uh, is changing the, the um, ideology mm -hmm. circumstance, no? Yeah. Like that that you talk, uh, the globalization can be, well, yes. he, he didn't live because he, he died when the globalization happens. But uh, even when uh, two cultures uh, have an, an, an encounter, uh, the the same uh, ideologic ideological circumstance uh, can keep in the mind of the people just for even in, in, uh, against themselves just for um, explain his reality or their reality, mm -hmm. no? mm -hmm. and that can. Uh, permit that the culture survive even against the economy change or okay okay I I, I, I would say um, um, in Germany and Europe we have uh, uh, big uh, right-wing tendencies but um, the, the, the right-wing movements are not dominant now and I think this this has to do with um, that it's economically not not um, the belongings of the economics uh, are not um, going together with the concepts of the right wing extremists. Now, I uh, I don't think that it's always <coughs> such a way. It's, it would be uh, dangerous if uh, maybe a more um, authoritarian structure of society in the whole. Would be necessary, maybe, but now, until yet, and now today, we are not at this point, um, and so um, we have a lot of <coughs> basic racism, so we call it. But uh, in a society which is more or less liberal, so I would say. Yes, I have a question. I would like to know if, besides the response from the institutions to racism, like the political education and so on, there is a spontaneous response from people. I mean, like a dialectic opposition from people, not coming from the institutions. Right, to racism. right, right. Um, we have uh, movements of the people of color, maybe. So, um, but in relation to minority movements in the United States, they are really small, because in Germany you don't have a tradition of this self-organization. But we have it, and they are, they are strong and they are loud now, and we have a, a big community of, uh, of uh, Turkish migrants, and uh, they have their own organizations now, and they are strong. And they make, uh, they demonstrate, and so on. Um, we have um, from the from the Jews, there's an organization um, um, of the um, uh, the Central Council of the Jews, it's so called, and uh, he pays. This institution pays attention what happens about anti-Semitism and the gypsies too have their own organizations. So you have such uh, self-organizations, but um, it's always in Germany. Um, you have always, if they are successful, you have a sort of controlling by paying through the state. So these uh, councils are paid now from the, from the state. 
in the 1933-1994, there were a lot of demonstrations in the cities against these pogroms um, from churches, from unions, uh, from circles, for keys, and so on. Um, but um, I would say, in Germany, spontaneous reactions, it, uh, our spo spontaneity is uh, not exploding, you see. Or maybe it's exploding the negative, I don't know. <laughs> but um, um, it's going always in, in controlled forms. I think really important are the, the self-organizations of the, of the immigrants. And they are, they are um, today, they are strong, yes. They fight. Um, well, primero, tras, ¿sí está bien? Sí, primero, ¿sí está bien? Sí, 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 sí. Después, no sé, ¿quién era primero los dos? Sí, bueno, tú ponías el logo. Sí, sí. Ah, Mateo. I had the impression that somehow in your, in your conference, you centered the, the problem in this elbow society. Mm. Uh, and with this into, or with the economic system, with capitalistic or late capitalistic economic system. And it came to my mind an example of a very radical uh, group of Mexicans, not in Mexico, but in the States. Uh, these are very strong Mexican uh, nationalist fascists, I would say. Mm -hmm. Right? I don't know if you could say that they're right-wing, though, somehow. But they share all the authoritarian and all the nationalistic and the violence. Okay. And in Italy also, I, I knew groups that considered themselves uh, left, okay? but somehow worked with this authoritarian, power-oriented uh, kind of natural selection system to to enter to the group. And once you enter, then there will be a lot of solidarity, somehow, for some form of solidarity. And uh, also the right-winged Italian uh, groups um, promoted themselves as being, um, as being very solidar to those who somehow share their opinions. And, mm -hmm. So uh, my question has to do uh, somehow with uh, what uh, Orkheimer and Adorno expose in their chapter of anti-Semitism. Because I feel that the problem is moved back, back to a perception problem, and more related to what you say about Robert, Robert Miles, about this structure of we and others, moved to, to the perception, or to this uh, even further back um, interpretation of these processes of uh, sedimentation and hardening of the structures in like delusion terms, in terms of Jules Deleuze, of these micro-fascisms that can be even uh, uh, interpreted or, or explained as layers that just, uh, you know, like ge geological layers that mm -hmm. somehow harden and, and, and become uh, like cancer layers that uh, uh, expand. But in general it's related to some binary form of, of organization, of thought and reflection. And uh, binary systems, I, I'm about to finish and just I want to hear what you have to say about it, um, always have a state of exception included. And this connects me to my interest in Agamben, in George Agamben. I don't know if you know uh, his thought. Uh, but the problem is that then you are accused of uh, somehow anthropologizing uh, the, the, the problem and ontologizing the problem and so on and so forth. So the, could you comment on this? Is there something rings uh, in any sense? Okay, I would say um, I will not decide for one theory or the other theory in the discussion about racism. Because I think it's a real complex um, subject, and um, 
I think we have such. Um, I think we we can say that um, in your behavior you have um, um, with your social socialization you have some behaviors, attitudes, and so on. You can't change it in every situation. It, uh, not only depends about the changing of uh, circumstances, but you have such a part like a character. But I don't think that this character is such stable as the older um, critical theory thinks it. So I'm, you, you heard it, I'm, I'm, I'm arguing with uh, different theories in this part now. Because I, I think that this, for, for me, is a question in, uh, in, 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 in Germany, and I try to, to solve it a little bit. The discussion about racism, the critical theory, doesn't play a big role in Germany. And I'm asking always why that. Um, um, the reception is uh, mainly the cultural studies and the postcolonial studies. And um, for me, these studies, um, they are important studies about racism. But for me, they are a little bit, um, they, have a, uh, they are voluntaristic in their politics. So, because um, they say it's um, representation, um, it's uh, imagination, it's symbolic, and so on, yes. And um, I think it's more materialized than the cultural studies thing, but it's not materialized in, in this Freudian form, so I would say. Um, I, I, I will say to, to other, <laughs> there, were, there were different uh, interesting parts because um, it's an um, interesting point to discuss if, um, I would say, right movements under immigrants, and we have in Germany too and in Europe, if they are right wing extremists or not. We have in Tur Turkish, Turkish uh, movements, they are really fascists, you see. But with the racist theory, I would say, in Germany, they don't have power. And to racism, uh, to the definition of racism, uh, it's important to have the power to set your racist structures. And if you can't do this, um, it's not racism what you are doing. So maybe they are not racist, but they, if they could, they would be a racist person. And uh, the second point, we have uh, different, uh, um, we, we have many um, researches about how came people into right-wing extremist movements and how goes the, they out, or how went they out. And uh, it's always the same point. They went in between, mostly between 13, the age of 13 and 15. 13 and 16, very young, about music, about some events. Uh, the ideology wasn't really important. And they walked out with maybe 28, at the age of 28, 30, and so on, because um, um, they, they um, experienced that there wasn't any solidarity in their groups. So I think this is important. Because right wing extremists and, and, and uh, click structures always um, um, they, they promise that there is a big solidarity. But it's function, if the group has the first problem, the solidarity is going away. Okay, I. Uh, I have two questions. Um, you said that uh, you are not um, starting the argument with, about the, the structure of the individual, and I agree. It's a uh, globally globalization, globalization. globalization. <laughs> structure. But my question is how it works because uh, I know it's structural, this authoritarianism is structural but also it affects the individuals. 
at, at a point that the individuals start to reproduce that in the daily life. Uh -huh. um, not only is there socialization and behaviors, but also uh, uh, related with the racism, making this discrimination uh, against the other in the same country. In Mexico happens a lot. Where, um, for example, we are Mexicans, but there are different, uh, I will say, cultures uh, in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are different um, institutions that uh, reinforce this authoritarianism or this uh, discrimination, but also people do does it against the others. So, um, how would be this relationship between the structural authoritarianism mm -hmm. and the, the concrete individuals that are in the middle of that structure? I don't know if I'm... No, no, right, it's a difficult question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, classically, you say your first social socialization is in the family. The second one is um, on the next level is your peer group, people like you are the same age as you. And the third one is society as a whole. And um, I can I can uh, explain it in, in, in Germany. Um, uh, the young, the, the children are coming to the kindergarten um, now early, in the first first year, the second year. So the family, the influence of family, I think it's uh, it's important, yes, but it's smaller than before. And then it's important what happens in the kindergarten, what happens in the school structure, and. Uh, here, I, we, can, we can see the, the structures, uh, the education of the kindergartens and in our school education. We have strong forms of authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. Because um, nothing is... Uh, it's uh, pseudo-democratic forms. And this is a... I think this is one of the biggest problems. Mm -hmm. If you learn democracy as... Not a, not a real democracy, but only... We have uh, it's 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 it's, uh, it's a love word participation. Mm -hmm. I think participation is not really democracy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in 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 school in um, uh, in the scout movements and so on, we all talk about participation, and this is uh, a reduced form of demo really democratic participation. And so I think um, the tendencies are that this is the, the direction of society, and this has maybe strong sense in the theory of, crit of the critical theory <laughs> today, um, is more direct. And uh, yes, I think the family, for me, fa the discussion about family, I think it was formally um, right. It was. Interesting, the authoritarian character was important. I don't know if you know the beautiful uh, novel um, Der Untertag from Heinrich Mann. Um, this is, he describes in this uh, novel um, the, the one person and uh, the main actor, it's the authoritarian person. Really, so you have to, to read it. Uh, I think it's translated in, in Spanish. It's really famous, but it's written in 1924, 25. And uh, this character is socialized totally in his family. And this, I think, has changed because it's direct to society, or more direct. Okay. Wow. Thank you. And you have talked on. Um, sorry. You have talked uh, a lot about uh, racism, but uh, what about the other victims of um, 
uh, right wing extremism, for example, you know, communists, homosexuals, uh, homeless, uh, disabled people. Um, as you probably have heard in, in Norway, um, there was a huge um, slaughter of young people who were social democrats. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. By this guy, which was, uh, last name I think it was Breivik or, or something. So uh, you see, it's it's quite interesting because uh, in this moment of crisis in Europe, um, the expression of uh, right wing extremism goes not uh, only uh, against immigrants or right, right, right. It goes against their own um, their own citizens, you know, their own people. Um, just because they think uh, they have other political views or uh, any other uh, sexual preference or uh, so, so on. So, um, in this, um, maybe we should think uh, the broader uh, concept not only of uh, racist uh, motivations, but also political motivations, uh, sexual, or, I don't know, religious motivations inside of this uh, kind of uh, hatred that includes uh, 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 right-wing extremists. All oh, right. Um, um, okay. Um, at the first, I'm defining racism a little bit broader. So or I told you here racism, but uh, this uh, group-focused enmity. They are yes. uh, homophobia and so on, part of it. And uh, there's a structure like in racism, too. The same, the differences, but um, uh, Heidmeier calls it uh, the same ideology. Um, and um, I see a little bit a, dif a difference um, to yeah uh, between racist attitudes and political fights. So. I, I, I try to, to, to show it uh, at the beginning of the lecture. Yes. Um, politically, you, dis you can decide yourself where you stand. So you are a human being because of the possibility of decision. Um, racism um, takes it away from you. Racism doesn't, uh, doesn't give you this possibility. And so you are in the focus of racism, not a human being, or in these discriminating structures. So this is for me the difference. When Breivik shot the social democratic young people, he shot them because he said they are responsible for the Muslim immigration. So the the <coughs> the, um, the, the um, enemies of Breivik are the Muslims mainly the Muslims. But for him, the political problem is the social democracy in, in, in Norway. But, um, and it's right, the young people in this moment, they have the, the possibility to decide, uh, to decide where they want to stay. But I, I, I am um, I can explain it in the National Socialism, the Communists, they had always the possibility to say, okay, communism is bad, and they, not all, but some came free from the concentration camps. This was impossible for Jews and Gypsies. And this is a difference, but I, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't want to say, um, um, it's easy to, to, to stand in such a situation. Uh, it's your free decision. You know? I, I think you have a responsibility. So um, it's a decision for other people, for mankind maybe. So you, you can't uh, say, no, um, um, I'm a fascist now. But you had, you had in, in, in the past you had, had the possibility decide. It was your own decide, decision, and it was not, it, did, uh, it has not depended from your father or your grandfather. And for me, this is an important difference. But you are right, um, 
we have to fight against anti-Semitism, homophobia. But I think it's it's uh, difficult for me. Always, it's difficult to explain the difference between racism, anti-Semitism, and enmity against uh, gypsies, because I think it's the same structure, but differs in the history, maybe. And uh, the moment of the Holocaust. For this, for me, it's uh, important that uh, that uh, anti-Semitism is, an, is a known form. You have to analyze, but the structures of discrimination, racism and anti-Semitism, they are the same structures. Yeah. <coughs> The question is, how far does the relation between fascism or racism as structure, society, and democracy go? It's like racism as structure, or the principle of fascism, the, distinct, the distinction between a we and the others, is an necessary part of democracy. Thinking on democracy as a system of competition, or is it is this going too far? In, um, no, no, no. Right, um, because the, I said the binaries, binary thinking, think, thinking in two poles is um, the structure of um, Western thinking. So. It's impossible to go out of this structure, and so at the beginning, the Western thinking is a racist thinking. So, this so is how, how we are to understand real democracy. Can we use the term? Yes, um, because the difference, and uh, this is what Stuart Hall tells it. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point. He says um, we have not only white and black. But you have different grays, grays? Uh, between white and black, different colors. And um, maybe it's necessary, or you can't think, in the Western tradition, I don't know other traditions, <laughs> uh, you can't go out of this binary structure, but you have to reflect this binary structure always. And with this reflection, you can come to um, to thinking forms and uh, society forms, which are um, which are always maybe thinking in groups, but not in in focus groups. And I think this is uh, the, the the approach from two from intersectionality and so on. That um, you, it's important to have in mind that groups always are changing. <coughs> so it's not a problem that uh, um, in the metro I'm I, I'm belonging to the group of the passengers and not to the to the instructors. Yes, it's not a problem for me. Uh, but I can change this group. I can go out. So I think um, maybe it's, uh, we, we, we can't uh, live together without group structures, but it's important to, to, um, to have the possibility to go out of this group every time if you want. And racism is again this possibility. And this is for me the democratization of democracy. It's, uh, um, process without an end. But there's one commentary because I think it's not only the problem to can go out, to be able to go out of the group, but only also to be the right to be part of it <laughs> without being a victim of aggression. No? Because if not, it would be the classical liberal position. And Mexico, we had it with Suarez, he said uh, there shouldn't be any racism, but the indigenous people should 
stop to speak other language. <laughs> they should, should be good Mexicans. Okay. Then they go out, they have the right of to go out of the group, as you say, but then, then they will uh, they will have less, less problems. I think this is a liberal position and it's better than the racist position, obviously. Uh, but it's also problematic. No, I think it um, should be also be the right to, to be different. No? It should be the right to be indigenous, Jew, etc. Et I think this is the, the debate Lanzmann, Claude Lanzmann, who made sure I spoke about this debate here with Sartre. Because Sartre said the Jew is an, 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 an the idea is an invention of the anti Semite. And Sartre and Lanzmann said it's not true. The Jew exists even <laughs> outside the anti-Semitic structures. No? He, he told that he has had, he has had a very long, uh, a very lo long time. I thought that perhaps Sartre is right. And then I came to Israel to know where were all Jewish women. We have been Jews since uh, 2,000 years without interruptions. And there, and they had a very, very small, or small place for make a, a ritual. And I have been with them in the synagogue, and then suddenly understood <laughs> the Jews are not only the mention of the Anisimit. So what I want to say is this: I think it's you are completely right, but it should be more than that, more than the right to go out of the group. This one, I don't know what you think about that. The other question I wanted to make you is: you said at the beginning of your speech that Germany, and I agree with you, that the big problem of Germany is that we never had a, a successful revolution. All the intents have been. Smashed down. So you think, or what do you think, or how do you think is the relation between that historic effect and the problem of racism today in Germany? Do you think there's a relation? And if there is one, which would be the relationship between these two historical facts? Okay. Um. I, 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 I. The, the title of of my lecture. The title belongs to the actual discussion in Germany um, that um, we are working against racism in society and if we speak with the politicians they don't understand what we mean because uh, they think okay this is the problem of the right wings and uh, we are fighting against the right wing extremism too. And this, not to understand that racism is not the only the biological, classical racism um, of the end of the 19th century. This has, has to do with the National Socialism. <coughs> so, um, um, for me, it's more important in our discussion about racism that happens the uh, National Socialism and this has to do that National Socialism happened, has, has to do uh, that we didn't have a revolution but, um, but our society and, 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 and this has to do with the, with the, with the term right wing extremism it's the wrong term because extremism uh, um, says that it's outside, it had nothing to do with us. And if you speak about racism, um, it's always scandalized because in Germany they will not understand that it's in the structure of our society. It's always racism is, has always to do with the right wing and the national socialism. And so for the politicians it's easy to do the racism to the side. So I would, mm -hmm. would um, say. Um, another point, okay, it's right. Um, um, we had in Germany until um, the year 2000, we had the use sanguinis for the citizenship. Yes. You know? Um, um, it means if you are, if if you if you um, were, were, um, but if you are living in, in France and you have a child, the child is a France citizen. But in Germany, it wasn't impossible. And they changed it at the first time in the year two thousand, and they combined 
the use samoginis and the use solis. Mm -hmm. So, and this had to do this uh, term of citizenship um, connected to the blood, yeah, to the, to the family directly. This has to do um, maybe that you never had a republic revolution. The other point of groups it's re, uh, is, uh, I know the, the discussion, uh, it's not only a, a discussion uh, under Jews, but uh, by the gypsies too. Um, and it changed, and it has uh, something to do with history too. That, um, there's a famous uh, Jewish historian, Isaac Deutscher, he wrote uh, magnificent uh, biographies about uh, Trotsky, Stalin, and Lenin. And it's not only a biography, but a social picture about uh, society in this time. And um, he was a uh, well, he's, he was a Jewish. He died, and uh, until 19. 1943, 1944, he said, um, I'm not Jewish, it's not interesting for me. Uh, I'm a Trotskyist, he was a Trotskyist. <laughs> um, he fled from Poland to um, Great Britain, and there he worked as a historian. And after 1945, he wrote a book with the title The Non Jewish Jew. And there he reflects this complicated. Form. And I think it's um, it's a it's a discussion without a solution. But the solution lies in this never-ending discussion. <laughs> um, because Jews and Gypsies they have the Holocaust. And if you and it's clear um, for this, like the Lukash and so on, they they weren't interested in Splock to be Jewish. It was wasn't interesting for them. But the Holocaust had changed it. And so you are right that it's important that we can change our groups every time, but we have to accept, or we need a society which accepts um, long standing groups too. So I must admit, I must admit, I must admit, I must have to accept that there are people that are just completely, I don't know, completely, they're, they're different. Completely different in some points, at least. You know? And I think that's why, as somebody told, I think the problem is in capitalism. I see you told also in the capitalist society, tendency, as Marx said, we need some equality. Mm -hmm. So, so it doesn't work with equality. So, in some structural necessity, the different groups must be must disappear. <laughs> they have to disappear. But uh, if not, capitalism has a problem. I think this is, in, ec in, economic, in economical terms, also one of the reasons of this problem. You know? mm -hmm. As Hocker, okay. I don't know, they, they work a little bit in the first three theses about anti-Semitism. Anti you know, the, the, the argument is this way in the dialectic of enlightenment. I think this is these two things. I think in this sense, also in this reason, in this sense, okay, I asked you right, the critique on the liberal. Yes, and right. liberal society and capitalist society, right? uh -huh. which go together. Yes, but I, I, I find, I don't know if, how it's it in, in Mexico, but uh, it's interesting that in the United States of America, there's a lot of such uh, minorities. Yeah, they are living their own way. way. <laughs> it's in Europe, you can't imagine it. You think uh, the society is exploding, but in the United States, it's, it's really there. In this point, they are liberal. And even in the United States, are uh, are really, how do you say that, to tell you about that, because if you are indigenous from USA and you married with another kind of indigenous, like a Mexican or Central American indigenous, you are not more, well, your, your sons are not uh, uh, indigenous more, even if bad parts are indigenous. And that is important when, like, an uh, indigenous from the United States have uh, this type of cars, 
you know, for health, and your son or your daughter or your, uh, don't get another kind of this okay. help because you lost if you marriage with another kind of people that not are are not uh, indigenous like you. And that is the other part of the mm. capitalism and the problem with the different groups into uh, society, no? It is not just the equality. This kind of difference between minorities, uh, well, uh, have another kind of, um, how do you say that, like a um, manipulating group, no? you are inside of a kind of group. Like you have in the United States, uh, you have a name if you are African-American or Latin African-American or not. All the time they are named the different groups and well, that's another kind of revelation of the society inside. No? No, that's right. Um, there's an interesting text about tolerance from um, Peter Brückner, a German intellectual, and um, which describes the problem of um, the tolerance which accepted different groups because it's working um, for the capitalist society because it um, a critique. Uh, Lobbyism. Yeah. And I think there's a very good argument from Hawker Madonna about antisemitism in the dialectic of enlightenment where they say Jews are the gegenrasse, but in the sense of okay. they're anti race, they're not a different race, they are something which is outside the concept of race. And this for the Nazis is even worse than Russians, for example. They hate Russians, <laughs> but at least they are the race in the Nazi conception. Not in Jews, they're even not the race. And I think this is also important in the sense because they, they, are, they are outside of this, this very strange group conception. Okay, now, now, then, uh, now we are in a re really difficult discussion. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if you know Sigmund Baumann, yes. uh, British sociologist, mm -hmm. and he speaks uh, from the truth they are sitting on the barricades, not on the mm -hmm. one side or the other, but between, in between. And, um, for this, um, an, another historian uh, speaks from the um, third, third place of the truth, outside of this binarity structure, or not outside, but um, um, for the anti-Semites, the truth explode this binarity, and for this they are more dangerous than the others because they are um, they are finishing this system. Mm -hmm. And I think at the end of the day we are all like this. And then what say we said now in the end of the day in some way it's never as clear as the races would the anti Semitism would like. Yeah. In some way we're always between one or another definition. In this sense the liberalism in the United States is much better than the uh, the European racist conception, I think, is also, but at the same time, it's also racism. They, they oblige you to be in one group and another one. Huh? You have to define yourself. I'm indigenous, I'm Afro American. If you don't have a definition of your own, you, you are in a big problem. You know? it's, it's, in this sense, this liberal conception is also very repressive. It's liberal. It's true, okay, that's right. Repressive. But I'm always uh, saying, maybe if you, if you, if you see uh, the conflict in Palestine, and uh, some anarchists and so on say um, we don't need uh, two state there, uh, but important is that everybody in this region um, underst understands itself as an individual. I think this is really naive, <laughs> not because you have a lot of history, um, you have uh, sufferings in the history of your people, a people is a construction, that's right. But it, ha it has materi materialized in history. And uh, so it's, it's, you can't say at this point 
I'm only individual. I'm only standing by myself. Because there is a responsibility for the history of my, my family, for the history of, um, as Jews called, my people. But because um, maybe if I um, had lived at the same time, it wouldn't be my destiny to be killed. It is what we saw before that it is all, it's not enough the right to go out of the group, no? And it is, but at the same time, I think also, I agree also with Hocker Madonna, it's not the individual is also not a solution because it's also a repressive construction. I think it's also yes, that you can decide what you want to be and to which group or to which groups you are belonging. This is important. That you can imagine that you are belonging to different groups. And the problem is if other decides for you. And if a state decides for you. And this is uh, okay, every mechanism and so on. The structure, this is what's this, uh, the structure of the uh, apartheid state in, uh, in South Africa. They decided if you are an Indian, um, colored, black, and so on. Huh? Yes, but I insist it's not only the question of decision, it's really also the right to be uh, as you want to be. Now, if you want, for example, Mexico speak uh, now, <laughs> you'd have to. Right. They have that, but you are, in reality you don't have it because you have a very big problem if you speak it for several reasons. But one reason is the, the justice, in the courts. Very often there is no translation. So in Mexico we have thousands, thousands of people, indigenous people in the jail. They even don't know why. <laughs> they don't understand that. In, so in, you know, they, it's, you can say, okay, you can go out of your groups, learn Spanish, and then you don't have this problem. Yes, okay. But I think it must be more than that. More than the right to learn Spanish and uh, forgot what, what did my father and so on. Really to right to speak, for example, now in Mexico without having problems for this reason. Uh, speaking the language and more, more questions. No, I think it's also this, not only go out of my group, that, that, that my group in some way, or not only my group, that some social reality, I don't know call it, some reality, some material reality is accepted. Mm -hmm. well, even if it's a group or in the individual, it's not so important, but it's a reality. It's a reality that Mexico, for example, millions and millions of people speak another language than Spanish. It isn't a reality. Mm -hmm. But the state and also the society don't accept it in some way, or accept it more or less. And I think this is what I understand. I think in this in this sense it's more than go out to the right to go out of the group, but the more the right, the more the right to, to, to decide. It's to the right to be completely accepted, even when you're strange. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> I would describe it. Uh, there are more questions or commentaries? I, uh, <clears throat> I just think that it's important to point out that it's not just the problem of uh, the choice of the group, but only the transformation of the group. I mean, it's not just like you have the right to decide in which group you decide to stay, but only we have a right to transform the group to, uh, themselves and uh, the way they are structured nowadays. I mean, just if we we assume that the groups are done and uh, we can say I can choose to stay in this group or that group mm. but mm. there's a problem that the groups just as we know them nowadays are also repressive <laughs> so we have to transform even the groups and that's the I think the most important part of the choice, of the free choice. If, if you think that the groups can be fixed, though so you have a wrong understanding of society, of development of society. So if you know that society isn't fixed, but it's always changing, you know? so it's clear that groups are changing in different forms, changing from the activity of the, 
of the group members. And uh, I, I, it's right what you what you said. I I, I don't want to to, to say um, it's um, so for me. People which are thinking in a racist way, they um, they always naturalize society. This is the problem. They don't have a social term of society, you know? and uh, this is for me important. Society has nothing to do with nature. It's only made from us, but in but not uh, from the individuals, but from the interaction of the di different individuals uh, in different forms of combining. But so it's normal, if you study history, it's normal that groups always changing. Yeah, but they not always assume that the people who belong to those groups have the right to change them. Yeah. Of course they change. Mm -hmm. If we say they don't change, then mm -hmm. history doesn't exist. But the problem is, uh, have we really the right to give us a form of a group or community? Or we have to belong to a given community in which we have to obey some rules? And we think that maybe we're free and we have the freedom to choose this group or that group, but not the right to give us as a community the form of the groups, like a decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you have always the process of fixation of the groups. Um, it has something to do with some rights or fellowships and so on. Maybe in the United States, I think it's that's the problem. So you have um, movements, self-organizations. They are defined by themselves. They are not um, uh, fixed structures. And um, after years, if it has something to do with um, maybe fellowships or written rights and so on, it's defined, the group is defined. And after this process, maybe if you are belonging to this group, you have the possibility to have some places at university and so on. It's affirmative actions. This is the one side. But the other side is that there are groups and you have, you have only the possibility, maybe, to decide, or your parents, to which group you will belong. Are fixed. Mm -hmm. so it's a stable process. And I think one very important question is I think for this reason the critical theory is not so important today, as you said, in Germany and the anti racist discussions, because they are, in difference of other theories, at least in the 30s and 40s, anti capitalist. And they are sure, in some way, that in capitalist society it is impossible. It's not only difficult, it's impossible to really change the situation of racism, anti-Semitism, etc. I think uh, in, some, in this way, uh, indirectly, without mentioning the word uh, revolution, revolution theory, you know, I think without an anti-capitalist, socialist, communist revolution, all these problems, they can be more or less controlled for not to, to perhaps to extreme consequences, but it finally it won't be impossible to not resolve the problem. For, the, for the, mm -hmm. what you call the elbow society, I think it's a better term is capitalism. <laughs> no? uh, because elbow society sounds a little bit moral. No? If I'm more nice, I don't use so much my elbows, though the society will be better, but I have to use them. If I don't use my elbows in the society, this, the just is smashing the other ones, the post. They have to use them too. It's not a moral question. It's a question of economical organization. So in this sense, I think this is, I think the problem a lot of anti-racist racist theories today uh, in Germany and other countries that they don't want to see this point. They don't, don't want to see that in this society, this problem never will be resolved. Uh, without saying that can, they can be done some things, I know, but really resolve it. 
I dare think as you said the, the phrase the sentence from Adorno uh, sorry from Horkheimer you indirectly mentions no who don't want about capitalism shouldn't speak out yes, about about I, I, I don't know exactly because uh, they are coming the, the actual racist the actual theory about racism um, are coming or they work with uh, Etienne Balibar they are coming sometimes from Algeria and so on. So um, I think the problem here is more uh, the Freudian theory, because um, they have a problem with this uh, psychologicalization of uh, interpretation of racism. I think this is the point, because you can't say that uh, Stuart Hall uh, he, he is uh, maybe a founder of the New Left Review, and so you can't uh, say that. Uh, He's not an anti-capitalist, <laughs> um, but uh, his approach is anti-foreign, mm -hmm. anti-foreign approach. And I think in the cultural studies, it's, it's the same one. Because they are, it's a critique, and in this critique, I, th I think they are wrong. It's always a critique um, of the critical theory that the critical theory um, didn't see the structure of society. And this, I, I, this critique I can't understand, but uh, if you discuss with, with uh, people from the cultural studies, they, they are bashing, would you say, they are, they are bashing a, a construction of a theory which they made to bash, bash it, but it had nothing to do with the complexity of critical theory. And for this point, I'm, I am, I'm, I'm not deciding only to work with the critical theory or only to work with the other one. I don't know exactly if this is, is eclecticistic. It's uh, eclecticism. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, dangerous, I know it. And um, I have some, some years uh, to work about. <laughs> uh, maybe in 10 years it's a little bit clearer. <laughs> so, no, it's, it's difficult. But I don't know if, like, if, how it's in, in Mexico. Um, in uh, sociology now, in Germany, the most uh, theoretic thinkers, um, we don't have one theory. So we look a little bit here, a little bit here, and so on. Um, I think it has something to do with the complexity and the, the processes of um, changing now and we don't understand really what, what does it mean, the capitalism now, you know? if it's post-capitalism, it's late capitalism, it is capitalism, or another one, it's postmodern. no, we don't know exactly. and. Uh, but uh, nobody thinks now there's one theory which ex can explain at this moment the, um, the development of our society. But I think it's important that you you can't com uh, this is uh, you don't have the right to combine everything. <laughs> this is theoretically not correct. And um, so um, you have to try. To, to, to look where are uh, interesting points, different um, theories, but then you have by yourself combined them consistently together. So I understand my form of theory building. <laughs> Encuentro una, una constante en los discursos, eh, por un lado, digamos, de izquierda, respecto de eh, discursos efectivos. Eh, discursos misóginos. Pero, me di cuenta, eh, el fin de tan constante, la has ¿no? ¿no? Eh, 
Nee. Ich meine, jetzt eine Konstante, sowohl in zwischen rechts und links sind äh, bezüglich Misogynen. Misogynen. Discursos misóginos, discursos homofóbicos, discursos de clase, discursos siempre eh, cuyo efecto es la negativización del otro. Hast du schon als außer mich so viel auch homophoben, äh, homophoben, wie man sich ist, in Museum? Klasse. Klasse. Ah, so ein Klasse. Klasse äh, so. Negativisieren. Die den anderen immer negieren, die das den anderen negieren. Das ist so eine gemeine Frage. Ah. Esos discursos se inscriben, äh, digamos, in términos reales, in momentos históricos concretos, que in este caso, sí se articulan in esta democracia reducida, a la que te referiste hace rato. Also die existieren eben innerhalb dieses Kontextes einer reduzierten Demokratie, diese Diskurse, von der wir heute haben. In diesem Sentido, äh, äh, los Echos del Nationalsozialismo, los Echos de las Pretensiones del Exterminio, no serían susceptibles de ser ejercidos a modo de derecho y en, si es así eh, en qué sentido convendría no más bien replantear el proyecto eh, democrático actual no also fragt ihn ob nicht so insofern ein Echo es gibt dass sich der Ausdruck materiell also Echo des Nationalsozialismus oder des Vernichtungsprozesses ob das sich nicht ausdrückt auch in diesen in diesen Prozessen ob insofern nicht das gesamte heutige demokratische Modell noch mal hinterfragt werden müsste. Replantear en qué sentido? De cuestionar o de... Sí, en qué sentido, ¿no? Eh... I, I mean, this uh, question is a um, little bit maybe simplistic, because I say if uh, you have a group which, which um, say it's a left group, but uh, they are anti-anti-Semites or um, racists or so on. For me, it's not a left group. So um, they, they, they didn't understand um, left theory. Um, we have a lot. Uh, I, 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 I don't say that... Um, The process of Stalinism is a right-wing process. No, I think this is a problem of um, of the history of the left. You have to understand it. You have to discuss it. Um, but if today and and this process is in the Soviet Union or um, like the New Deal in the United States or the National Socialism. There are um, some, some equal tendencies, and these are tendencies of the modern societies. Mm -hmm. But after 1945, you can't be, I think. Excuse me. I hate to interrupt, but I have to retire. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so if you, if you don't re reflect today in the left group about the history of the left and uh, about the processes of um, concentration of people mm -hmm. and so on, um, you are not, for me, not in the tradition of a, of a left, I would say. Mm -hmm. Don't say about in the tradition of the critical left, but you are not left for me. It seems only that you are maybe a left thinker, but uh, for me it's a right and a, con a right wing and conservative thinking. And for this, I, I, I put for me democracy is an important important aim, but uh, democracy not that does not mean parliamentary. Maybe. There are a lot of different forms of democracy that means that all people, we had to define in which form, global maybe, or 
at the university or in this room maybe um, can decide together and all people have the same rights to decide but um, for me democracy and equality is connected and equality means for me the equality of property for this, I think uh, the liberal democracy um, is, in, is uh, equality in rights, but an inequality, inequality in properties, and inequality in properties means uh, inequality in uh, production units. You know? And I think this is a point. It's crucial until today. If you have this inequality of production units, you can't have a real democracy. It's impossible because. Um, if I'm sitting here, um, and uh, here sitting a boss of uh, X, no, this is the state, you said, um, of a, of a Hewlett Packard or so on. Um, so it's we, we, we can't discuss in equal form, or we, we you know, because we have uh, other means to to make his uh, interests strong. So the concept of democracy for me is important, but you have to find the form of democracy. <coughs> and I think our democracy now is not really a democracy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> <risa> eh, eh, más bien sobre una tradición crítica. Eh, ¿Cómo no me lo entendí? Partiendo. Ah, partiendo. ¿Ausquen para la crítica teoría? ¿Teoría crítica o crítica? No, partiendo de una postura crítica. Respecto de los ejercicios democráticos actuales. Sí, que son ahorita democráticos en praxis. Eh, parece ser que al interior de la democracia los individuos eh, creen o se dan a sí mismos el derecho de pertenecer o de no pertenecer a un grupo. Eh, en términos muy generales, los individuos creen, creen pertenecer a un grupo que tiene el derecho de discriminar o el derecho de pretender aniquilar a otro grupo o a los individuos que lo conforman. Di ejemplos de misoginia, de homofobia y de clasismo. ¿En qué sentido, y esa es la pregunta, esto, lejos de ser una contradicción con cualquier principio democrático, es más bien efecto directo? No. En este sentido que decía, bueno, yo tengo el derecho de ingresar y tengo el derecho de salir. O sea, el ejercicio, el ejercicio real de eso, eh, si tiene, digamos, si supone algunas cosas que para mí sí, me, sí, sí resultan peligrosas. Also man dem es halt gefährlich, eben, äh, zu sprechen vom Recht in der Gruppe rein zuzuhören oder nicht zuzuhören. In diesem Sinne. Mhm. Das ist gefährlich, deswegen das Vermittlungsrecht. Ja, yes, but, 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 but what does it mean? In the, in the Duo, it's, um, it's a plädoyer for, for the pure individualism, without group identities? No, no. No, porque justamente estos derechos eh, 
los individuos los toman de grupos. No, no creo. No, no, yo, yo no podría pensar un individuo sin grupo. Ok, I know one group which uh, don't think in, um, in uh, destruction of other groups. These are the Gitanos. Mm. They, in, in, in the whole history of, of uh, 400 years, they never um, um, distracted other people. Never, never, never. So I think um, I think it's the possibility to reflect about your group identity. So, no. In our society, um, um, there racism and so on. It has a function. It has a function for groups and for individuals. That's right. Mm -hmm. Um, this has something to do with the structure of our society. And uh, for that, it's the, uh, all of groups, or the most of the groups, um, <coughs> they have uh, tendencies to, to distract others. I think so. So, in this point, you are right. But um, the question is how to manage it. I think it's important if you are belong to a group. So, I am belong to different groups, uh, but uh, one group is the group of uh, uh, teachers in your university. <laughs> and um, for this, I try to work in this group against um, tendencies of power, maybe. To destabilize this powerful group. So for me it was really impressive <laughs> to see the, um, the mural of, I don't know, Rivera, I think. This, um, this parole, um, you can't be elected a second time. For Mexico it's known. Not that it's wrong. For me, it's really revolu revolutionary because this is a problem in all in all parliaments in in Germany and at the university too. And so I I I try to work in my group against such tendencies. So I would understand maybe the possibility. work for against these destructive tendencies. Mm -hmm. But in the whole, like we discussed, in the whole, um, we can only work on the places where we are, but I myself can't change this society. Okay. One last question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in liberal democracies, when um, they have to deal with the problem of um, extremism, not only right-wing extremism, but also uh, left-wing extremism, um, they um, usually say that uh, we cannot uh, judicialize, criminalize, or penalize uh, ideas, thinking, you know, only when, it, when they are crimes. So uh, this um, this in this liberal approach has a problem because um, maybe there are uh, some ideas that that are crimes in itself. I don't know if you would agree with this. Um, and also, uh, uh, well, there there are ideas that are waiting to become crimes yes. too. You know, but uh, the problem is it that uh, for liberal democracy, can we tolerate? Intolerance, 
can we tolerate uh, just because they are they maybe they, they think different they are wrong I don't know who's to say isn't that um, how to deal with this without being also authoritarian mm -hmm. okay and I'm coming from a country where we um, have uh, some in, in which some ideas are forbidden so uh, it's forbidden, and you are going to jail if you uh, negate the Holocaust. And it's forbidden to um, say something against um, other groups, uh, against other ethnici ethnicities. This is the consequence of the World War II. Um, so, um, from, if, you, if you ask me what I think about it, um, my position is not clear at this point. <laughs> because I think in a stable democracy, um, you don't need such um, laws. I think Germany isn't a stable democracy, though we need it. But it would be better it would be a better sign if uh, we didn't need Dutch laws. So this is uh, my answer to it. Because I think always it's a problem if you, if a state tells its population what it has to think. Exactly. And I'm against this. But, so the United States, you you can think what you want. And in, in, in France and Great Britain, it's, it's the same one. And only in Germany, because of the history, it's some, some things are forbidden. Well, but, but the problem is that uh, right-wing movements are uh, growing and are taking a more political... Uh, yes, but you power. can't fight against them uh, with uh, forbid for fighting. <laughs> um, the ideas you have to argue against it. Yes, absolutely. This is politically. This is the problem I think of uh, the mostly uh, our our discussions uh, um, in political education uh, against right wing extremism. That that um, we we try to manage it with um, democracy trainings and anti racist trainings and so on and. Um, we lost the political discussion. And I think the, you, you have to politize, politicize the people. But what about our historical experience, you know, for example, with the rise of uh, National Socialism uh, and the Weimar Republic? You know, the, it might be just another political group uh, and the other forces, well, try to do the, something similar, you know, we are going to discuss the things here, uh, you know, the procedures okay, right, of democracy. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. So, but what about if they are the, the denial of all of that, of democracy itself, of dialogue itself, of the political discussion it's, itself? Can we discuss with them? No, 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 it's not necessary to discuss with them. If you discuss with right-wing extremists, you discuss only with them to convince the audience. This is the, the, the important question. Okay. So it's a, um, if we um, working with young people, so we have to decide um, if it's a young person which is interested in right-wing, in the right-wing movement because of music and so on, so you can discuss with, it, with, with um, the young people because they, are, they don't have closed ideologies. But if you have an activist of the right wing movement, it's, you can't convince them. So it's, uh, you, it's not necessary to discuss with them. With, with them. It's necessary if you are going to a group from right wings writing persons, um, and uh, at a public point, um, 
maybe in a passenger street or so on, where they are standing. And if you discuss with them, it's important only that the um, people around, that they can understand what the problem of the right wing is. Because if, if you don't stand against, in, in, in public against the right wing, um, the other people don't have arguments. And for this, is, it's important. If something is convinced about this is a, this is a problem of the structure of anti-Semitism and uh, racism, um, it's had always a new argument by its right. So it's always a circulus idiosus uh, in, in the discussion. But it's only interesting then um, if you discuss with them for the other people. One thing about the liberty of speech in Germany, because it's not only forbidden to deny the Holocaust, it's also forbidden to speak about the Holocaust. Because some years ago, in some way at least, it's at least if you speak especially, especially about one person, some years ago they changed the law in Germany uh, about the archives. And in Germany, if somebody is mentioned in the archives that he worked in a concentration camp, you can only mention it publicly if he agrees. And he doesn't agree, and he say, oh, if, he, 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 if he died, the family has to agree. Or oh, you have to wait for 100 years uh, until the, the historical fact uh, finishes. Before it was 30 years. And they changed it to have 100 years because they want to protect the Nazis. Now Germany not only protect the Jews against the Nazis that are forbid that you have to, you can't deny the Holocaust, but you can't about to speak to the people who work in the Holocaust. It was a big problem for Lanzmann. And he made the film Shoah. He told that he had to bring every week the whole material from Germany, when he filmed in Germany, to Paris because a legal problem that German police could take him away the material. Because it was illegal, illegal what he did. He filmed German Nazis in Germany. It's completely illegal. The German government no, no, never did nothing against him because he was too famous. <laughs> and the, the French government protected him. But legally, they could put him in jail in Germany. They won't do it, he's too famous. But somebody less famous can be, and in general, I remember how Hermann Josef Absit was a very important person who worked with Hitler, and now you know him, in the uh, financial sector. And when he wanted to speak in the, the university, there was only one, one professor, Egon Becker, who was against it publicly. He criticized it in the uh, Senat, no, in the German in the university, the democratic structure. And then uh, the president of the university said to him, Mr. Becker, or Professor Becker, you should be very careful, careful, because you know Mr. Absi has very good lawyers and you can have a big problem if you speak again uh, badly about Absi. And Habermas was that person, he didn't have say nothing. Mm -hmm. I remember it's very good because Habermas always speak about the free discourse and these things, but when, he, when they, they said to me, you can go to chain for to speak of the historical reality, uh, it's, it's dangerous. And he was not lying. Just uh, his reality. What I wanted to say is this: You are right. It's perhaps it's problematic to forbid some expressions by against uh, or saying that the Holocaust uh, didn't happen. But I think it's much more problematic. Than I think. <laughs> no? I think it's in Germany. There's a taboo, but, a general taboo. Right, I think that this um, right that you are talking about is Seventy years or thirty years after you are dying? It was thirty years, today it's one hundred years. It they changed okay. They changed this is for the protection of, of family familiarity. So um, I don't know if, if this doesn't exist in Mexico. No, really? Okay. No, I don't know. No. Any topic? No. no. Yes? Yes. Imagine you couldn't speak badly about Profio Diaz. Without asking me. It's like this in Germany. <laughs> Germany, he does an exception because nobody defends him, but. <laughs> no, no, it's Mexico is a democratic country. In sense. Don't hate me. <laughs> In this question, I don't know. Shall we stop? Let's get high. Yes, so it's okay. Or you have some final words? 
Well, thank you very much for the long session, but uh, for me it was really interesting. Yeah. I hope uh, it was interesting for you. Yes. Thank you Hello. for your attention, and uh, I'm impressed from this university <laughs> <laughs> such students. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.